Hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining us today for our live webinar, SharePoint Migration Best Practices and Strategies, with the one and only Todd Klimt. My name is Ivan, and I'm a sales manager here at Siskit. We'll also be joined by Todd, as well as my colleagues, Matija and Eva, who will be showing us a demo of SPDocket and other tools after the presentation. Many of you already know us as a company, but for those of you who don't, uh, let me briefly introduce you to Siskit. Siskit is a software development company uh, founded more than 10 years ago. We develop products for SharePoint on-prem documentation and administration, as well as products for Office 365 governance and auditing. We currently have more than 3,000 customers around the world, and many of them are well, very well known. We currently have six products, including our famous SPDocket for SharePoint on-premise documentation, as well as Siskit Point for Office 365 governance and security. Now, before we start, just a few of housekeeping rules. All registrants will receive a recording of the webinar within a few days. After Todd's presentation, which is next, we will have a short demo of SPDocket showing how it can help you with your SharePoint migration. And we will also briefly show you our Office 365 tools that can help you once you migrate to the cloud. We will then have a Q&A session with Todd where you can ask any questions you might have. And for that, please use Q&A fun function on top right of the screen to ask your questions throughout the webinar. And now let me introduce to Todd if he even needs any, any introduction. Todd is a Microsoft MVP, SharePoint consultant, and a very good friend of Siskit. Todd has been a SharePoint specialist for over 15 years and is one of the most influential people in the SharePoint community. And he specializes in infrastructure and administration topics for both SharePoint and Office 365. Also to mention, Todd regularly contributes as a speaker for major conferences in the US, Asia and Europe. And I will now give a warm welcome and turn things over to Todd. Todd, are you there? I am. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, let me share my screen here. I hope I get this correct. Nothing embarrassing shows up here, does it? You're good. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for the introduction. I will say it makes me a little sad, though, because I haven't gotten to speak at any conferences this year. I used to uh, be able to run all over and see my friends and spread the good word, and this year has been kind of tough for that. Um, but I get to do things like that, which like this, which is good. Uh, I, I, I really like that. So um, Yvonne did a great job with the introductions. I will throw my vanity slide up. Uh, number one, it makes my slide deck look bigger. And so that just looks better all around. But number two, it's got my contact information on it. And Yvonne had that on his, uh, but you can email me, uh, whatever. Happy to answer any questions. Hit me up on Twitter. A couple of folks hit me with questions for this webinar on Twitter, and we're going to cover those. So that's always a good place to get a hold of me. And just with since we did our last webinar, I got renewed for MVP. So it's 15 years now that I've been an MVP, which is pretty crazy to imagine. Uh, I didn't think I would ever get it the first time, and they just. They just keep letting me in, so I appreciate that. But again, reach out to me uh, whenever uh, you've got questions. So uh, when I pitched this idea to the Syskit folks when we were talking about it, I was talking about how I wanted to, you know, the best practices and how to make migrations easy. And then it recurred to me that we're really just making them easier because migrations are, are very complicated. And so I kind of wanted to lay out the structure that I use when I work with customers and that our company some practice uses when we do migrations. And that's what this presentation the next, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes is going to be is lessons that I've learned sadly a lot of them the hard way as I've done the migrations that you're all going to have in front of you. And one of the questions that I had on Twitter was what kind of migrations we're going to talk about. And it's going to be all of them, a lot of them, because a lot of the concerns and the techniques in that overlap. So this isn't just for people who are doing, you know, SharePoint server to SharePoint online or whatever. All these ideas are going to be uh, going to be applicable. But I did want to talk about the specific challenges of each type of migration up front. So I've kind of got on this slide the types of migrations that you're going to see as you're moving, uh, as you're migrating SharePoint. The most common one that I see right now is on-prem SharePoint, so SharePoint Server, up to SharePoint Online, the product formerly known as Office 365, now known as Microsoft 365. I can't, can't get used to saying that extra syllable, so you're going to hear me say Office 365 a lot, but it is Microsoft 365. 
Um, so this is the migrations from on-prem SharePoint server up to the cloud. And this is, I, I've, it's been fun. I've been doing migrations now, for just SharePoint migrations for 20 years now. I've used every version of SharePoint in production. So I have migrated from every version of SharePoint to the next one since SharePoint uh, 2001 team services up to SharePoint 2003. Uh, and then it's been fun watching the landscape and how it changes. So probably 10 years ago, migrations were all on-prem to on-prem, you know, and before that. And then five years ago, I started seeing an uptick in migrations from SharePoint on-prem to SharePoint online. And that's when Office 365 really became a viable product. And uh, before the so I guess we step back so before the 10 year thing I saw a lot of migrations from file shares up to SharePoint and then SharePoint to SharePoint and now SharePoint online and then those sort of ebb a little bit not completely I see a lot of those today but now we're seeing some new types come in the online to online I'm going to talk about that uh, a late a little bit later um, but when you're doing an on-prem to online migration one of the uh, the traps you can find yourself falling into is doing the, the dreaded, the much maligned lift and shift. And that is just taking your SharePoint data as it sits on prem and moving it up to the cloud. And I'm going to talk about in some, some of my next slides why that's a bad idea. Don't don't do that. But they are so similar that it's very easy to talk yourself into doing that. We'll talk about why that's uh, why that's a bad idea. Uh, another type that we're going to talk about is online to online, and this is that new breed of migrations that I'm seeing. And this is migrating from one Office 365 tenant to another Office 365 tenant. And there's two, three-ish reasons that I see customers doing that. Uh, the first reason is mergers and acquisitions. So company A, they've got a presence in the cloud in Office 365. They acquire company B, and they decide they need to merge their tenants. And that is for financial reasons, so that you're only paying one license for every user. And also just for management and user experience reasons, that's much better if everything shows up in one search interface and everybody goes to the same spot. We're starting to see those uh, pop up. They're, they're not too common yet, but, but it's happened enough in the last year that I see, uh, see where it's coming. And uh, Dean Gross was one of the people who, who reached out to me on Twitter. He had a couple of questions about this. One of the questions that he had was, you know, this, this talk here is about migrating SharePoint to SharePoint, but he wanted to know about migrating everything in Office 365. Is there a good way to do that? And right now, Dean, there's not. Uh, the SharePoint to SharePoint migrations work pretty well. Those APIs are really well fleshed out. We've been doing these migrations forever. But what I'm noticing is I'm doing some of these migrations for some of our customers that the other products aren't quite there yet. And number one, I'm looking at you, Teams. There's a bunch of customers who have a good presence in Teams. They have a lot of Teams channels, a lot of Teams private chats and things like that. There is no backend API or a very weak backend API to move that to another tenant. That's been a real pain point for some of my customers. If you want to read up a little bit more about why this is a problem and some of the approaches you can take, Tony Redmond has some good articles at Petri.com, P-E-T-R-I.com, about how that API in the back end is lacking and what they're kind of doing to fix that. So the online to online migrations, that's something to, uh, one of the things to keep track of is, is how those other products are gonna work. So mergers and acquisitions is one of the reasons that people do those. Divestitures is another reason. So now you've got this big company inside of Office 365 and they're carving off a, a chunk of that company and selling it to somebody else or that company's breaking free. So it's the same idea. You've got an Office 365 tenant, you're spinning up a new one and you're taking content uh, and moving it out. And we're gonna talk about some of that a little bit, but that's one of the reasons uh, cu customers do those kind of migrations. The third reason that we see customers doing online to online is just a renaming. So we've got one customer that they, they're, they're staying as a, as one unit, but they're changing their company name. And there's some baggage associated with that company name, and they really don't want to see that in their tenant anymore. So they're wholesale migrating one tenant to another one. Everything's exactly the same just to get that name out. Now, I expect somebody in the chat, I'm watching that, uh, to chime in and say, well, Microsoft's talked about tenant renaming. They absolutely have. And from what I understand, that's in public preview. Uh, that was not available to this customer. And I think like all the rough edges haven't been worked out of that yet. Uh, so they they opted not to do that. They, they really wanted to get rid of this name. So that's another reason to do online to online migrations. And we're going to talk a little bit about some tools that you can use uh, with that later on. The last bucket I have there is the something else to online. 
Uh, and this can be the primary crux of your migration or or maybe not. And I'll talk about that in the middle in, in, a, in a little bit. One of the things that I should have probably broken out is file shares to online should also maybe be their own line item here. I've got them. I'm going to cover them into something else, uh, but I see a lot of those. Um, and one of the things that I, I do a lot of those migrations and one of the things that I have to sit down with customers and talk about is File shares have been around forever. Uh, dinosaurs use them and they've continued on and we're just comfortable with it. We're, we're used to using those. Users know how to use them and we're used to all the things that we've done to make the data fit where we've got it. But they're really limited. And when we get into SharePoint Online, we don't have those limitations. And so one of the things that I have customers do is sit down and look at that data and decide you know, how we're gonna, gonna do that. And one thing that the file shares do have in common with the other uh, sources that I'm going to talk about, Box and Dropbox and Google Drive and all those, is that they all have different sets of features and they all handle things differently than SharePoint Online does. So as you're moving content from those other places into SharePoint Online, you see sort of need to align that so that you don't just bring the old way in. File shares is a particularly easy example to talk about because one of the limitations of file shares is it doesn't have metadata. You've got the file and that's it. So we found some ways to work around that. One of the ways that we work around that uh, is we have really long folder names because we, we embed the metadata into the folder name. And when we move to SharePoint Online, having really deep folders in our document libraries is a bad idea for about six different reasons. So that is one of the talks that I have with customers. I say, you know, how can we, we, we change that? The other way that file shares deal with metadata is we put it at the end of the file name. And so we've got, you know, Todd's important presentation, Todd's important presentation, uh, Eva edit, Todd's important presentation, Eva and Ivan edit, Todd's important presentation, final, Todd's important presentation, final September. We, we dig all that stuff in and we don't want to keep doing that moving forward. So we want to look at things like versioning and metadata and things like that. So when you're moving from some other system into Office 365, that's something to keep in mind. I mentioned a little bit earlier that sometimes that's the main focus of the migration and sometimes it's not. So there have been a couple of instances when customers have come to us and said, we want to migrate our SharePoint server, our beloved SharePoint server, and move it up into the cloud. And we've started talking to them about what their vision is and things like that. Uh, and then I ask the question, where else do you have data? What other systems do you use? And they mention, well, we've got some file shares and, and things like that. Uh, and I say, well, have you talked about moving that into SharePoint as well? And they sometimes have, sometimes haven't. There's some really great benefits to that. Uh, one of them is, again, you've got that single uh, location for users to go to for all of their files. It's a well understood thing that uh, SharePoint should not be a file server replacement. I'm not suggesting that, but a lot of those files do make sense in SharePoint. And if you can get them all in one place you know, for your users, that's a win there. The other uh, thing that I will mention is that also gives you a single pane of glass for security. So if you're in any kind of industry where you've got legal regulations, uh, and, and I love how you, you you walk this fine line in a lot of industries, you have to keep certain documents for a certain length of time or you get in trouble, uh, but if you keep documents for too long, then if you get sued, they can be used in discovery against you. And so you have this narrow window where you have to keep the document. So if you've got documents in SharePoint and file shares and all these other places, that can be easy to lose track of. So if you can move some of these other systems into SharePoint Online, you can set all those retention policies and things up in one place and feel better about that. Those are all great reasons, but the one reason I found that people really get excited about moving other things into SharePoint is money. So when I talk to folks about moving to SharePoint Online, I say, where else do you have data? I'm like, well, this group, they use Box for something and these, you know, they use whatever. And so I say, okay, well, you're already, uh, you're already paying for Office 365. Wouldn't you like to stop paying for Box? If we can move that data into SharePoint Online, we can save you some money. And for some folks, that's the main reason they migrate is to save that. I get these, these great, um, customer interactions where, where folks will say, hey, we've got this data, we wanna migrate out of box. Oh, and we have to have it done by July 1st because that's when our re uh, renewal thing is we don't wanna have to pay them again for another year. Totally get that. So keep that in mind when you're doing that. Um, so if you, and I guess one of the other things that I mentioned that somebody mentioned it in the chat and I missed it is also, as you move things out of other systems, file shares, box, uh, whatever, and move them into Office 365, it gives you good remote access. Some of those, obviously, you know, the, the cloud ones already have that, but also, again, a single way to give people remote access to files easily, securely, things like that. 
You'll notice I haven't spent a lot of time talking about on-prem to on-prem migrations. Uh, hopefully you're not considering one of those. If you're considering an on-prem to on-prem migration, you may want to look at some of the other life choices that you've made. Uh, some of that might be bad. I kid, there's some very good reasons why people need to do that. Uh, but but really, at this point in time in, in, in the SharePoint evolution in Office 365, if a customer comes to us and they want to do an on-prem to on-prem migration, I do everything I can to, well, first stifle the laughter, but then try to talk them out of that because that's just, that's sort of a dead end. Microsoft is going to continue making more versions of on-prem SharePoint. And there's no concern about that. But the functionality and, and all that is just uh, such a such a tough spot. I did one migration for a customer a couple of years ago. We had this conversation and I said, you know, let's uh, let, let's move you into online. They said, no, we really want to go to SharePoint uh, 2019. OK, you know, we talked about it. They had some some decent reasons. A year or so later, they're like, hey, uh, how tough is it to migrate SharePoint 2019 to the cloud? And I'm like, well, I've got good news for you. It's not very tough. We've got some tools for that. So so think about that. Migrations aren't a lot of fun, so you might want to uh, minimize those as much as possible. Uh, Joe asks in the chat, another file server migration I ask is my users moving to uh, SPO, if they have any spreadsheets that could be made into lists. Uh, so that's a good, that's another good uh, functionality difference, Joe, is that on prem when you have file shares you couldn't do things like uh, the, the excel viewer you know the web viewer or some of those things that are excel spreadsheets online or on prem in file shares are that way because they can't be lists i think some of that functionality uh, create a list from share, from an excel spreadsheet is still in sharepoint i've sort of lost track of that but that is a good uh, a good use for that joe if you've got any of those i know joe uh, personally he's got my information if you've got any of those reach out to me i can i can help you figure those out Preparation. Uh, so this is one of those things I feel a lot like the person in this screenshot. I like doing like the first 60% of the preparation because you need to. It's the foundation of a successful migration. But man, once I start talking about migrating and talking more about migrating, I get antsy. I just want to actually do the thing. I want to do the migrating. I'm one of these folks that loves getting in. Uh, I, I wear short sleeve shirts, so I don't have to roll my sleeves up when I go to work. I just enjoy migrating and, and doing the things. But every time I get anxious, uh, one of my coworkers pulls me back and says, all right, bud, we got, we got some more planning we need to do. Uh, the preparation is really key. And so th some of the things, and we're gonna talk about some of this in later slides, Part of your preparation is knowing what you have. So we talked in the last slide about knowing where you're coming from. Are you coming from on-prem SharePoint? Maybe we're going to mix some file shares into that. Maybe we've got some bad news for the Google folks. We're going to pull some Google Drive things in. Knowing where you're coming from is good. And then looking at that data and seeing what we need to do to, to make it happy for SharePoint Online. And this is where I talk about even if you're coming from SharePoint on-prem to SharePoint Online, you still need to be aware of what's going on because depending on which version of SharePoint you have, when you set it up, there were different best practices along the line and the product did different things. So one of the common ones, and I'm doing a migration for a customer now, they have, uh, they've been in SharePoint on-prem for a really long time and they have a lot of subwebs because they had to back in the day. There was, that was the only way to get the navigation they wanted and the search the way they wanted. In SharePoint Online, subwebs, uh, they are a four letter word. And I know to all of my English speaking folks, that doesn't make a lot of sense, but uh, they are really a bad thing. Microsoft has really gone out of their way to make it tough to create subwebs in SharePoint Online. So if you've got a system that was, again, perfectly valid before, but now has subwebs, we need to think about re-architecting that. And, and the tool that Microsoft has given us in SharePoint Online now is hub sites. So now instead of having a uh, a big site collection with a bunch of subwebs. Now you would have a hub site. So we're talking marketing, something like that. Uh, and then you would take those subwebs and start breaking those up into other sites and making them a child of that hub site. Uh, so that's one of those tools that you would have. Uh, broken inheritance, that's another one. So when I talk to folks and um, we, we talk about you know how to scale, especially after I've just had the subweb talk with them. I tell them everything should be a site. That's your unit of scale inside of SharePoint. It always has been. 
Uh, and one of the many reasons to scale by that is because the site is a permission boundary. So when I'm looking, when I'm using a tool like, you know, SP.Kit or something, and I see a lot of broken inheritance, a lot of, you know, folders or webs or whatever that have broken inheritance and have unique permissions, that rings a bell for me. And I'm like, should this be its own site? It's got its own uh, permissions. So that's something to keep an eye on, look for uh, broken inheritance and then see those and think maybe they should be their, their, own, uh, their own sites. Customizations is another one. Customizations are a lot of fun. They make SharePoint look great. They are also the bane of your existence when you try to migrate. So uh, on your source, so if it's SharePoint on-prem or whatever, the more customizations that you have, uh, the tougher your migration is going to be. And a lot of those customizations just aren't going to migrate. So I'm gonna talk a little bit, uh, well, it's probably in this slide, about reducing uh, the cruft. So the thing, the more things you can remove from your source before you migrate, the easier your migration is going to be. Uh, so the, the, the phrase that I colloquially use when I do this session, uh, you know, in, at conferences and stuff, is don't upgrade crap. And crap can be content. It can be, you know, Word documents from 1995. That can be crap. But customizations can also be crap. So as you're looking at all these little one-off things that you've got, you know, stand back and ask yourself, is it important that I bring this thing forward? Is it important that I have, you know, this particular widget, those kind of things? Uh, because the, the, the less of that that you have, the more your easier migration is going to go. And then the next migration, whatever happens next, there's going to be, um, it's going to be easy. So, Another thing that you need to know after you figure out what you have is what's going to make the cut. Not everybody gets to move to the next level and play in SharePoint Online. Uh, so you have this, this discussion as you're looking at what you have, you, you sort of have three buckets that that content can go into. Uh, things that you're just going to delete, and that's the you know what's going to make the cut. The things that are going to migrate just the way that they are, and then things that you're going to re-architect and, and rebuild in your destination site. So having those three buckets and deciding what goes where uh, is really helpful. So, and these can be some hard conversations. This can be content that just doesn't make sense. This can be sites in on-prem SharePoint that never got used, things like that. But again, the less you have to migrate, the better your migration is going to go. Obviously, the faster it's going to go. Uh, and this is where I'm going to start talking about bringing in your users and your business owners and things like that. They're the ones that know this. Um, one of the things that I always talk about when I talk to customers is Steve Jobs is when he when he brought out the I think it was the iPod or the iPhone I forget one of them he had this famous phrase where people don't know what they want until you tell them what they want and there's some truth to that and when we're moving to SharePoint Online it's the same way users are used to using their spreadsheets out of their file share and they're fine with it. They know how to do it, they've been doing it forever. They don't know that they want versions and they don't know that they want all this crazy stuff that SharePoint Online can do until we show them that they want it. And they're like, oh my God, that's great. But the other side of that is we have to balance that with they still need to do their job and they know their job better than we know their job. So we need to find the combination in the middle. So getting your business owners in the migration planning process early will help you out uh, 100%. It will help you uh, decide what the end looks like, you know, again, how things are getting broken up and what functionality is going to get used, but it's also going to help you with the decisions of what makes it and what doesn't, because they will know. The accountants know better what accounting data has to go forward. The engineers know better what engineering data has to go forward. Uh, so do you really need to migrate at all to something? Do we, do we bid a fair farewell to some of that old data and just let it go? Um, that's a, a decision you have to make. And now that you've got your business owners involved and your customers involved, Know when it's going. That's another uh, piece that, that's important. Coordinating with your business unit. Number one, it's just you know, respectful. <laughs> you don't want to surprise any business unit uh, Monday morning by saying, oh, by the way, uh, Friday, that place you used to go for all your stuff, well, now it's all over here. Uh, enjoy SharePoint. You don't want to do that. So you want to coordinate with them and plan with them. But the other thing is you have business units that have some very rigid schedules. Uh, so like, for instance, uh, my wife is an accountant and they have things that happen at the end of every quarter. And, you know, at the end of every year, tying things out. So uh, while it might work perfectly to move engineering's, all of their data, the first uh, two weeks of April, that might make perfect sense uh, for them. For the accountants, they would be rioting in the streets, or at least as much rioting as the accountants can do with their, you know, pocket protectors and all of that. But you, you need to talk to each of your business units and find out when their mission critical times are so that you can schedule, uh, schedule around that. 
they need a seat at the table. And the other thing is I've found the earlier I get the business units involved with this planning process, the more tolerant they are of all of the problems I'm going to cause when I start moving things in because they have a sense of ownership there. They, they have been heard. Uh, so bring them in early. So I've talked about how you need to know what you have and, and what's going to make it. How do you do that? We've, we've already decided that that's an important step, but where are the tools to do that? So a lot of that has to do with where you're coming from. Uh, so you need a good inventory to figure out what's there and what it looks like and all of that. Microsoft has some tools out there for you. Uh, if you're coming from an on-prem source, so SharePoint 2010, SharePoint 2013, I don't think they've updated this for SharePoint 2016 yet, uh, but there is the SharePoint Migration Assessment Tool, affectionately referred to as SMAT. And that is a tool that you can download from Microsoft for free, run it on your on-prem server, and it will vomit out a directory full of Excel spreadsheets for you. <clears throat> I don't know what the planning meeting was for, like for that uh, when it first came out, but I assume somebody said, well, we've got a list of all these get PowerShell commandlets, uh, get SP web app, get SP site, get SP web. Can we just run them all and have them each spit out to a spreadsheet? It sort of feels like that. It's not really that, but it sort of feels like that. Uh, so you're going to get a lot of information, but it's gonna to be tough to work through and, and, and make good decisions based on. But it's gonna show you things like lists that have more than 5,000 items and lists that have too many columns and large site collections and things like that. That is one way to do it. One uh, often overlooked and unsung hero is the storeman.aspx page, the storage management page. So this is a page that your users can go to, site collection owners and administrators inside of SharePoint, and they can see exactly where all of the storage in their site is being allocated for. So this is one of those things where you run the SMAT or you run some other tool and you go back to engineering and you say, listen guys, you've got this five gigabyte site collection. And they're like, there is no way that it's five gigabytes. And so you send them to the store man page and they can see exactly where that is, where it's being used, drill down. It will show them where all of their files are being used. Because again, one of the things that's gonna make this migration better for everybody is if you migrate less content, if you just don't migrate things that don't need it. So if you can send them to that early and they can see all the places where data is being wasted, they can delete it ahead of time for you. So in the slide deck, and I think we're going to send this out, uh, and Syskit folks, I need to send you an updated version of this because I added some links. Uh, but my uh, coworker, Mark Anderson, has a really great blog post on Storeman and how to use it and what it, what it looks like. Again, free tool built right in. Your end users can use it and it will just show you every list and every library exactly how much space uh, it's taken. So those are on-prem to online migrations. Uh, if you're doing the online to online, so this is for folks like Dean that reached out to me on Twitter and some of my other uh, customers, the SharePoint modernization scanner. So this is SharePoint online to SharePoint online. Oh, and somebody in the chat jumped in. They said that uh, the migration, so the migration tool supports 2016. I don't remember if the SharePoint assessment. So, the, so there's the SharePoint migration tool and the SharePoint migration assessment tool. Uh, somebody in the chat just mentioned that the, the, the actual migration tool supports 2016. I don't remember if the assessment tool does, but jump in there. I'm watching the, watching the Q&A. Um, the SharePoint modernization scanner lets you know what things inside of SharePoint online can be modernized. And that's a whole, I could do a whole nother 40 minute talk on modernization. Uh, but there are a bunch of objects inside of SharePoint Online that, that started out in one way and now have modern versions. And that can be pages, that can be lists and libraries, that can be sites, all of these things. There is a classic version and now a modern version. And I'm really curious what they're gonna call the next version, the postmodern version, the moderner version, uh, I have no idea. But if you're going to be migrating from one tenant to another, this is a good way to see this because if you've got these classic pages, got these classic uh, sites, this is a good time to modernize them as you move them over. So the SharePoint modernization scanner is part of the patterns and practices, the PNP, and it's going to scan and there's a whole lot of items in there. A couple of things that it shows off is it shows off whether you've got classic workflows. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, info path forms, things like that. So it lets you find some of the bugs that you've got in there. I've got a blog post on using it for workflows, but you can use it for a bunch of other things uh, as well. 
And then, uh, of course, there's a little tool you're going to hear about in a couple of minutes from my buddy Matya, uh, SP.Kit, which will tell you everything you need to know about your on-prem farm and in just a friendly, loving way. Uh, not like that migration assessment tool does. It doesn't care about you. It doesn't love you like SP.Kit does. But Matya will tell you all about that. Um, so what and when, we talked a little bit about that, deciding on what folks need to bring over. So we have we want to get the cruft out. We're going to work with our business unit, uh, units and let them uh, work on that. The other thing that gets overlooked a lot is training. So depending on what the system you're moving from looks like compared to SharePoint Online, user training is a big deal because they just need to know how to get to their files. And so don't forget that. I do a lot of training sessions. I do the, the migrations. I'm up, up to my elbows in mud doing migrations, but then I get to do the software thing. I get to sit down with the accountants and say, hey, here's how you work with Excel Online and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's an important part. Don't, uh, don't forget that. Um, and the when, so we talked about how each group has specific times that may or may not work for them. But the other thing that you need to figure out as you're doing my, your migration is just what order. So you've, you've figured out where it's coming from. You figured out what's gonna make the migration cut or the re-architecting cut. Now you need to know what order you're gonna do it in. And so with most customers, we just have a big spreadsheet that has everything we're gonna move over. And then we just have you know a, a date or, or maybe a first, second or third wave, something like that and we just fill all that in. That spreadsheet also normally has a column for who's responsible for it because I'm usually not the only one doing migrations. Usually the customer's helping out, so we can we can do that. The other thing you wanna find is you wanna find some groups to test with. And there's a couple of uh, determining factors on that. Things like how much do they use SharePoint? So if you've got really heavy users, you wanna get them in early, get them trying it out. If you've got groups that uh, you know maybe are going to be less resistant or less less accepting of change, uh, maybe you want to put them to the end till you've got some of the kinks worked out. So just know you know what groups you can test which, which order you're going to go into, uh, and keep them involved. If you've got a lot of data, big sites, terabytes, and all that, you're just not going to be able to do it in a good migration window. So depending on which migration tool you use, and we're going to talk about that in the next slide see if there is an incremental option. So this is the idea where, let's say our accountants have uh, 200 gigabytes of content we need to move up and we've done some tests and we know that's gonna take a couple of days. And so we run that during the week and then we use that tool again on Thursday to do an incremental where it only copies new things. And then Friday when we flip the switch, uh, we only have to catch up from Thursday. We don't have to do the whole 200 gig. So that's really a tool specific thing. Uh, so check that out with whichever tool you use. And then communication, let everybody know what's going on and give them information in the links that you send out. Here's, you know, you wanna go to uh, office.com when you start your day, cause that's where your new things are gonna be, uh, that kind of stuff. And again, if you're, if you're making big architectural changes like with hub sites and groups, make sure you've trained them on that and that they know how to, uh, to navigate all that. So how are you going to migrate this content? Uh, so Microsoft has a couple of options for you. They've got the free migration tool, the SharePoint migration tool, and this works for on-premises uh, content sources. So 2010, 2013, 2016, and it's got some integration into online. You can schedule agents and things like that. It's come a long way. I haven't used it in the last six months to a year, but I, I've been reading and they, they've, they've really you know, they've come a long way. So definitely take a look at that. That is free to use. You can go to the link and download that. A year or so ago, Microsoft acquired mover.io. And that, so again, the SharePoint migration tool handles on-prem, file shares, SharePoint, all that. Mover.io is the complement to that. It only does cloud sources. So it does do Office 365 to Office 365, but it also does Box and Google. It is online only. So it only does cloud sources. There's nothing to install. The interface is all online, all that. So mover.io free for Office 365 users and it is for cloud uh, migrations. Uh, another option that I've seen some customers use is the PNP PowerShell. So if they've got nerds like me that just can't use PowerShell too much, uh, the PNP PowerShell has some great commandlets for uploading files and creating things like that. And I've seen people write some really impressive scripts for taking a file share or something and uploading it to Office 365 or, or SharePoint or whatever. So if you've got some little things and you like to fiddle, uh, that is there. You're gonna need to know the PNP PowerShell anyway. You can't be a good SharePoint Online administrator without it, so you might as well do that. Obviously, there are third-party tools out there that you can take a look at. 
uh, depending on what your specific scenario is, what companies you already have relationships with. So if you've already got backups or something or already using an on-prem uh, management tool, they might have something for you. I've seen some customers kind of cheat and use the OneDrive sync client to do that. So the way they do that is we create the SharePoint site, uh, they sync to it with the Office client, and then on their desktop, they drag files into that and that syncs it to the cloud. And that works, but it's got a lot of limitations. There is a, a limitation to how many files you can sync. Of course, you can you know, disconnect the sync once you've moved everything up, uh, but there's you know metadata limitations, things like that. It's, it's ugly, it just feels dirty. Like I just wanna go shower with my clothes on when I see people doing that Ugh, to get the stink of it off of me. I love OneDrive, but that's just not a great management or a migration technique, but it is there. That is a good one if you've got, you know, help people uh, up, uh, upload their own things to their, their OneDrive location. It is good for that. One thing that I want to mention is that you can mix and match these techniques. You don't have to use one for all of them, especially if you're cobbling together some of the free ones. Uh, obviously, the SharePoint migration tool only does on-prem, Mover only does online, so you're going to have some combination of those. But don't feel obligated to wedge that tool into every scenario you're using. If it makes sense to do some other thing, uh, do that. I mentioned earlier that we've kind of got three buckets. Data falls into the, the delete, the, the see you later, and then there's the uh, migrate just as it is, and then there's the re-architect. One of the things that you can do with a lot of these tools is massage the data as it goes in when you're doing that migration. So we talked about how if you're going from a file share, you don't have metadata, but when you're going to SharePoint Online, you do. Uh, so this is one of those things where you can, a lot of the tools will add the metadata as it copies in or you know things like that. So look at some of those options to automate massaging the data uh, as it goes across. Post-migration work, um, communicate with the users. Uh, you know, one of the big things is making sure you lock up your source content so that people don't continue putting you know, new shares or new things in the file share when they should be doing it online because you don't want to lose content. And then also have a drop dead date for deleting the source. So for things like Box and Dropbox, when your license expires, that's an easy one. But for file shares, you know, you're going to make it read only and then at some point you're going to take the share away. For SharePoint Online you're, or SharePoint On-Prem, you're going to make your SharePoint site read only and then at some point delete it. But have that plan ahead of time. Know that so you can stick to it. I want to spend the last couple of minutes talking about uh, tips and tricks that I've learned. The client is always the bottleneck, and that client is usually your machine. So if you've got a lot of data to migrate to the cloud, running it on multiple desktops, things like that will speed things up. You might get throttled, so watch out for that. Uh, that's something that Microsoft does on the server side. Different migration tools handle that differently, but again, if things aren't going quickly enough, spin up another PowerShell window, spin up another instance, put it on another machine. That's one way to speed things up. Small files are the bane of migration. I know I said it was customizations earlier, but now it's small files. Every one of those files has a second or two of overhead as SharePoint uh, creates the file and sets all the metadata. So small files are really painful. Versions are slow. So if you have SharePoint on-prem, uh, if you can look in your, your list and libraries and see if you've got any that have lots of file versions, if you can pair that back, that will make your migrations go a lot quickly, more quickly. Manage metadata, that's a good win. Uh, if you've got an older SharePoint installation and they didn't use managed metadata, but you found in your inventory that a lot of places have the same columns, think about moving those to manage metadata. Workflows, well, you've had to have been living under the proverbial rock to not know that SharePoint 2010 workflows will not work in SharePoint Online in about a month and a half, two months. Uh, so if you're going to be migrating them, know that, have a way, you know, have a plan for making those uh, Power Automate uh, things. InfoPath, InfoPath still works in SharePoint Online, but again, at some point that's probably going to go away. So this is a good inflection point on uh, moving those over to uh, Power Apps and versions. So I mentioned that earlier. I'm, I'm, I felt so strongly about it. Apparently I put it in twice. File versions get away from people if you can limit that. I've also seen some things where there are instances of SharePoint on-prem where you could have unlimited versions for a document library, but you can't have that online. So uh, look for those. Um, and that is it. So I will come back to that slide. I hit my 40 minutes exactly. Matya, I've got them warmed up for you. I've got them whipped into a lather. Knock it out of the park, buddy. Yeah, uh, so I'll just jump in. Thanks, Todd, for the awesome presentation. And um, just to remind you all, feel free to publish any questions you might have. Um, but then again, let's go to Matya. Matya, you ready?
Yes, sorry, the window minimized when I share my screen. It's a little bit strange UX, but happens. I hope you can see my screen. Oh, yeah, we, the wrong we can see each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the screen numeration is not correct. It's a little bit strange. Okay, hopefully now you can see the correct screen. It's yep. it's okay now. Okay, so this is Espadocket, and uh, like Todd mentioned, uh, the key for a successful migration is good preparation. So you need to know what you have and what you can leave behind, and this is something definitely Espadocket can help you with. So this is the home screen, and we'll skip on the features that can actually help you do your migration. So first thing that uh, you want to know is, let's say, challenge number one is how is your farm configured what do you have and you can instantly see on a dashboard uh, how many site collections you have where is the which one are the largest so that's where the most of the content is located and other interesting stuff like where are your farm solutions so from here you can basically drill down to any farm configuration and here you can instantly see a list of all your site collections and what's important here is that you can actually notice that you also have contacts. And if you go to the usage and properties, you can also see the sizes and the number of subsites. So like Todd mentioned, uh, SharePoint Online doesn't look kindly on subsites. So this is something you might have to break up to sites in, in the online legends. Uh, Another thing that Todd mentioned is the farm, farm customization. So farm solutions is the old way of doing customizations to a farm. So this is something uh, how you used to do it. And here you can see a list of all farm solutions deployed uh, to your farm. So basically these are the things that you have to change because you cannot migrate them. And this is definitely something you need to take care of. Uh, and we also offer the solution and features report, which can help you uh, which can help you figure out uh, which solution maps to which feature. So definitely something you have to know. Uh, the next thing that uh, Todd mentioned is actually finding uh, stale sites. So sites which are not active, you don't have to migrate them, and that can save you a lot of time and effort. So in order to do that, you can do you can use analytics report inside Espadocket and you'll find the site collection analytics. And here you can actually notice that we have a report that shows you total visitors and hits that the site has. And it shows you that for a different period. So you can select different periods. And once you view this data, it's pretty easy to see historical data. And from the graph, you actually can sort on the last axis and you can figure out which sites was actually never accessed or accessed somewhere in the past. So maybe you don't have to migrate them. So that's something that can definitely be useful during a migration. Uh, and if you have multiple subsites, then this is something that could help you. But what you really need in that case is to drill down deeper and for a single site collection, so you notice that we're looking at a single site collection, you can see the same report, but at the subsite level. So in this case, you can see that I have a bunch of subsites, but only one of them is actually being used. So once again, this is really useful and you can see the size of each subsite. So if you're planning to split them out, this is something that you have to use. Uh, and the next step is that if you need, you can even go down to the document level and see the, the statistics, views and edits of, and size of each document. OK, uh, so I already mentioned that the subsites is something that you might consider breaking up. So in order to do that, you have a couple of options how SPDocket can help you. So the first one is that on the site collection analytics, you can definitely look at the total subsites. And you'll notice down here that you actually have a dedicated historical representation of how many subsites there are on, the, on that site collection, how many are active. And you can also view details about the storage on different dates. If you need more information about how the subsites are actually structured, you can always use our SharePoint structure report. And here you can simply say, I'm just interested at the subsites. And you 
get a nice looking report. Let me just expand our groups and you can see a complete overview of the SharePoint structure and the subsites you might need to break down into sites when you go to online. Uh, and what is also important when you're looking at the subsites, like Todd mentioned, if they have unique permissions, maybe you have to do something about that. In that case, you can jump to the permission reports inside SP Docket, and we actually have a report called unique permissions. And once again, I'm selecting the same subsite, and you'll notice that it's listing all the places that have unique permissions, even down to the file level. So everything you see at Red Square, it has unique permissions. And this is something you have to think about. Should this be this way or should I change it when I'm moving to online? And if you want to see the actual permissions, you can use our permission metrics report, which will actually show you the same data. But for each document, if you drill deeper, you'll actually see all the list, all the documents and the people that have permissions and what kind of permission on that document. So definitely something you can use and something that can be useful for breaking up sites. And that's a requirement in, if you want to groupify sites after migration to use modern feature like Office 365 groups or uh, creating Microsoft Teams out of your sites and stuff like that. OK, uh, so now I'm actually going to switch to another machine. So you might notice that the home screen is looking a little bit different. And the reason for that is that actually what I'm showing you now is SP Docket version 11. So this is something actually that's not out yet. It's coming out in November. So what you're seeing here is actually a preview of the features to come. So Todd mentioned uh, that you definitely could have trouble if you are using old SharePoint 2010 workflows as they will stop working in a month. So how we can help you with this is the, that in version 11, we'll actually offer new reports dedicated for workflow usage. So the, fir the first one is workflows on farm. So this is a high level overview. What are all the workflows that exist on my farm? And you can actually see cool data, and one of that is, is the workflow custom, or is it built in? And what's even more important, you can actually see the last activity for each workflow. And this is very important because uh, you don't want to rebuild workflows that are not being used. So this can definitely save you time and money. And since this is a high level overview, if you want to get all the details you need for the migration, you'll actually notice that you can drill to the workflow templates. And here you have different filters. And you can see on each site which workflows exist. What kind of uh, workflow exists? Uh, is it connected to a list content type of subsite, declarative, uh, global, and what are the number of associations? And even if this is not enough and you actually need to see all the connections that a workflow has, uh, to the content type subsites lists, you can even go to the most detailed report, that's workflow associations. And this will tell you, for example, for this workflow, Igor's uh, SharePoint 2010 list workflow, it's connected to this list on this site, and you can see all the necessary information, how it's configured. You can even see links to the history of task list, tasks list. So, if you're wondering who is actually using this workflow, you can just click on that and see all the data. And of course, all this on the right hand side, you have important filters because SharePoint 2010, those are definitely the workflows you, you're going to have trouble with. So you can check that. So uh, basically, we only had limited time. So what I've shown you is only a fraction of what SP Docket can actually do. Uh, you see that we have many other features, including detailed permission reporting, detailed analytics, and also Todd mentioned uh, storage metrics. So I'll just take a couple of seconds to show you that. Just let me go to the other machine. Uh, so detailed storage metrics is something that SP Dotsky does very well. So you notice that we started at the database level and each site collection can be completely expanded, subsites, folders, lists, and for each level, 
you can actually go down to the document level and you can see the size of each version. So something that's also very useful in a migration. And you have other features like audit reports, best practices, even uh, the ability to enforce uh, custom policies on your fund. So we had very limited time, so be sure to check it out. And always, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us and ask for a free demo. So Ivan, I'm handing it back to you. <laughs> Thanks, Matia, for the wonderful demo here. So um, now let me introduce you to Siskit's Head of Engineering, Eva Erceg, um, and she will give you a brief look into our Office 365 tools that will and can help you once you migrate. Eva, you ready? Hi, Ivan, and thank you for a very nice introduction. So uh, just like Matthias said, this was only a fraction of what SPDocket can do for you guys. Uh, it's definitely the ultimate admin tool for every SharePoint admin, so it's not only good for migration, you can definitely use it for your day-to-day -day tasks and it will help you greatly. Nevertheless, if you decide to follow Todd's advice and you take the cloud path, so you decide to move it online, uh, we also created Cisco 365 tools to help you get started on cloud as well. So it was a difficult task replacing SPDocket, but hopefully we managed to do it. So the first one, the first I'm going to talk about is Cisco Trace, or as we like to call it, the SPDocket for Office 365. Uh, the main motivation for it, it was that once we heard a customer saying, um, the moment I'm done with my Office 365 documentation, it's already out of date, which is definitely true. And with this one, um, you're only one button away from complete Office 365 documentation. So we wanted to make it quite easy for you to always know how your Office 365 services are configured. So just like with SPDocket, if you guys have tried it, uh, you get to create a snapshot. We collect the uh, environment configuration settings. Uh, you can easily compare it and keep track of changes. Uh, what is also important, you can definitely do the tenant to tenant comparison, which is good if you're doing the tenant to tenant migration, of course. Um, if you are not sure uh, and you really want to keep a tight eye, you know, we can uh, definitely arrange automated snapshots. So you just choose the preferred schedule and you can receive uh, documentation and changes to your email without even uh, actually monitoring the tool. So um, no unwanted change will go through you, even though if you have multiple admins or regardless of all the Microsoft continuous updates that's going on in your environment. Of course, you can always export those reports to PDF or Excel and share with your colleagues to always have a last status of your environment. If something goes south uh, with those automated snapshots, you will have your configuration backup and you will know what has been configured and what has been changed. So you can definitely uh, try it and send us your feedback. Second tool. Uh, it's the one that's um, a centralized tool for your security and governance. So uh, if you tried SPDocket, you can do the permission management, you can do the permission reporting. Uh, the same thing is with Syskit Point. So we really wanted to create a centralized place where you can get all the answers immediately. So uh, who has access to what, uh, what was changed and when, but also a place where you can automate some most common uh, governance processes. For example, as you can see, we offered the automated access reviews. We created this tool. Um, we created a simple interface so you can share with, with your IT teams, but you can also share with business uh, owners. So the resource owners, the team owners, uh, the guys who know which content should be there and which users should have access, but also with the team managers and chief security officers to, to keep a complete control of your environment. Um, Syskit Point supports Microsoft Teams, uh, SharePoint Online, Office 365 Groups, OneDrive, and it also enables you to keep track of your external but also internal users all from the one centralized console. So just to repeat, you can definitely uh, report on access, activity usage, you can uh, manage uh, user access, uh, automate some common uh, IT tasks, and you can keep track of who is doing what in your environment. But that's uh, not all. We never sleep, so our development team is al already working on something new. So I can share with you that we will be adding a schedule report, just like in Cisco Trace. You will be able to receive the reports on your access, security permissions, and inventory to your email. 
Uh, we are also working on adding alerts. So for example, if you really want to keep a tight eye on some specific document or folder, uh, you will be able to receive alerts if somebody shared it externally, if somebody uh, deleted that file or even downloaded bulk documents and doing something suspicious with it. Uh, the third area is adoption and usage reporting, so you will be able to uh, keep track of your Office 65 uh, return of investment. So if you just migrated, you want to make sure that people are actually using what you created for them and that uh, you are aware of the areas where you need to invest in the education and training for your people, just like uh, Todd mentioned. So if you want to be one of the first ones to see what we are cooking, uh, join our early adopters program, give us your feedback and help us uh, help you with your Office 65 environment. Uh, if you liked uh, what you saw, regardless if it's SP Docket, Syskit Trace, or Syskit Point, uh, please contact us. These are our contact emails. Uh, we have also a feedback forum, so whatever suits you best, we are eager to hear your impressions. And that's it, Ivan. I'm going uh, it back to you, giving it back to you. Thanks, Eva, for the excellent presentation here. And now the moment uh, you have all been waiting for, it's the time for a Q&A session with Todd. So please feel free to ask any questions. And Todd, are you ready? I am. I, uh, I just kind of want to do the slow clap. The I, I've seen these tools since the beginning, and it is amazing. You guys have added stuff since I've seen it last. I was, um, when Monty was showing the SP.kit, I had a couple of questions about things you've added since I seen it last. And before I could even write them, he had already shown the answer to the question that I had. Uh, so it's uh, it's really good stuff. Uh, so there are a ton of questions in the chat room, and I think uh, you, the Syskit folks have a slide with my contact information on it. We're not going to get to all of them, but for those of you whose question I don't answer or I don't answer it sufficiently, shoot me an email. Happy to follow up on those. Uh, so I'm going to start uh, a couple. I'm going to pick my favorites because that's how I go. Uh, Chris J asked at the beginning of the hour. He's been very, very patiently waiting. He's moving a, it looks like a, a hosted on-prem environment, which is accessible only via VPN into Office 365. And his question is, is Office 365 as secure as the VPN uh, scenario is? And I would say absolutely. And for those of you who've been, uh, you know, Joe, my buddy Joe's in here, he's been coming to my sessions for 10, 15 years. I was an on-prem guy for a long time. And the reason that I was on prem, one of the reasons was security, because I had this illusion of security. If, if something happened, I could go yank the network cable from the wall and, and protect all my servers. Uh, but what I realized again, that was just the illusion of security. Azure and Office 365 have security things in place that are just crazy. I, I, don't, I don't have time to get into all of it. Chris, if you want to email me, but I would say I absolutely positively trust Azure security model and the, the things that they do that there's that, that Tom Cruise movie Minority Report where they have the precogs that can predict crime before it happens. I swear to God that Azure has some of those folks in a, in a basement somewhere because they can step in front of bad guys. There are some really great stories on how they blocked uh, password you know, spraying attempts to get people in. They've got some fun, uh, functionality in place to protect you against ransomware. Uh, so I absolutely feel confident about that one. Um, so there's a bunch of questions about workflow. So I'm going to try to hit a, a bunch of these at once. We've talked about it a little bit. SharePoint 2010 workflows will always work on prem. No problem with that. So if you're staying on prem, you're good. If you're moving to SharePoint online, they will stop working here. I think November 1st, October 1st, something like that. Uh, so finding them and replacing them before you migrate is very important. And again, that's going to be something you're going to do in Power Automate. As far as I know, there are no tools that that migrate those. It is a fresh rebuild. It is opening up, you know, flow.microsoft.com, new flow and starting from scratch for those. SharePoint 2013 workflows are a little different animal. Uh, those will likely get uh, re retired at some point, but there's no deadline on that. There's no date, uh, but I would work those into that if you're going to be rewriting things, uh, do that. Raymond Little asked about network shares and what the best way to do that is. He's asking, do you prune in place or do you create a new destination and say, move the things you want me to migrate over? I've done it both ways. It depends a lot on the size of your organization and just how your organization works. So uh, for some organizations that I've worked with, I knew that they would never delete a single file. And so I said, go out and delete the things you don't want me to migrate. They would never do it. So I had to go the other way. I had to say, here are the things that I'm going to migrate. 
if it's in here by this day, I'll migrate it over. If not, it gets deleted. Uh, but for some other companies that were smaller and had you know more active people, again, that's something you got to feel out with your company. You probably know them uh, better than I do. Ravi asks, are there any best practice documents for migrating MS Teams from one tenant to another? Ravi, there are not. Uh, and that is one of the places where the API on the back end just isn't full yet. And so there, it's, it's difficult, if not impossible, for third party vendors to migrate teams from one tenant to another because just all the pieces in the background aren't there. Uh, but keep an eye out for that. Microsoft knows it's a problem. They're working on it. Uh, so hopefully there'll be something out there for it. Somebody mentioned in another one. I think, OK, it looks like Martin uh, asked about moving from SharePoint on-prem up to Teams uh, and if there are any tools for that. So without getting into too much of an architectural discussion, Teams the files and, and all that are just SharePoint document libraries. So you create an Office 365 group that creates a team and a planner plan and a distribution list and SharePoint site and all that. When you migrate files into that group, you, if you migrate them into SharePoint, they will show up in Teams. If you migrate them into Teams, well, you're really migrating them into SharePoint. Uh, so he mentioned that he's using the SharePoint migration tool and it's very time consuming one at a time. It is, and I don't know, I haven't used that tool in a bit, but I think you can fire up multiple instances of that. So you might have to go that route. Um, but again, if you've got more questions, reach out to me about that. Ian apparently has a lot of classical things. He's uh, got a couple comments in here. Uh, a whole session on classic to modern would be helpful. Uh, that's good to know. I, I think I've got a couple blog posts on that. I think Mark does, but the folks at SysKit are always looking for ideas for webinars and things like that. So consider that one uh, noticed. Yeah, but it is a good topic, I agree. And then Ian also asked uh, how to convert subsites to site collections. There is no automated way to do that, Ian. And the problem with that becomes subsites, and then the whole benefit of them is they consume resources from the, the root web of the site collection. And so when you pull that data out, you know, when you pull the, the, the sub site, the team site, and the document libraries, and all that, when you take that out and put it in its own site collection, how do you know which resources from the site collection and the root web do you pull over? So some third party tools have that. There is no way with built in tools to chunk out a site collection or a subsite into its own site collection. But third party tools uh, will, will step in and do some of that for you. Uh, huh. Matthias is asking, can I estimate the maximum throughput in data of gig per hour when you migrate from SharePoint 2013 to online? Uh, that is an impossible one. Uh, so that so that comes up every customer asks me that, uh, and I there's just, it's just I've never been able to find a way to get that uh, the, a number that was that I would get more than once. Things to consider are your pipe. Again, I mentioned that your client is likely the bottleneck. So, are we talking about moving one gigabyte in one session on one machine, or one gigabyte on two sessions on one machine, or the, the numbers uh, fail out pretty quickly. I also mentioned that small files have a lot of overhead, a second or two per file just to get it created and spun up. So then is that gigabyte you know, all 1K files, or is it 10 meg, all that kind of stuff. My estimate and my, my uh, uh, recommendation for that is to get some sample data and just try it and just do it a few times and measure it out. But I've never found a number that I could reproduce. Uh, the the, uh, the SysKit folks are doing the uh, the equivalent of playing the, the playing off music. <laughs> they put the, uh, the sign up at the end. Again, uh, for those of you whose questions I didn't answer or you have follow up questions, todd.clint at simpraxisconsulting.com or hit me up on Twitter. Happy to, to discuss them all. Yep. Well, thank you, Todd, and thank you all for joining us uh, for today's webinar. And just to mention for everyone, those of you who registered and attended will receive a recording of the webinar within a few days. And if you have any questions regarding SPDocket uh, or any questions to Todd or to us, just reach out to uh, sales at sysk.com. And uh, what else to say? It was a pleasure having you all here. See you next time. Thanks, everybody.